Hello, I'm Paul Douglas. In this video, you'll see me go through my mixing process as I mix a piano-based instrumental full production in Reaper. Now, if you haven't seen my video on how I wrote and recorded this song, uh, I recommend you at least have a brief look at it. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below. Hopefully, you'll pick up a few tips and tricks for mixing your own songs using Reaper. Please subscribe, ring the bell, like and share this video. Now, I guess I'll start by just a very brief explanation of what is mixing. Um, the idea is very, very simple. Um, you've recorded a load of tracks, you know, maybe drums, guitar, bass, piano, vocals, whatever. All mixing is, is make sure that all of those are at the right volume relative to each other. So making sure that nothing's overpowered, anything else, you can hear everything clearly that you need to. That's it. That is mixing. Now, it sounds simple, but in practice it can get quite complicated. I try and keep it as simple as I possibly can. Now, I have a, a multi-stage process that I stick to, uh, and, and the reason that I do that is to stop me, sort of, my mind wandering and trying this and then trying that and, and getting, you know, confused and, and in a mess. So you can see my project uh, loaded up in Reaper here. Um, now, first things first, a couple of preparation stages before we even start mixing. First stage, maybe I could call this stage zero, get organized. So the reason we do this is to just make your life easier later on in the mixing process. So you can see here that I've, um, I always have a standard consistent way I arrange my tracks. I always have drums at the top, then bass, then guitars, then pianos or keys. Um, if I had any vocals in this uh, in this project, they would come next. Um, and you can see I've used colours for all the tracks. Now there are only ten tracks in this project, so it's not that um, it's not that difficult to find a track that I'm looking for. But it's not unusual to have a hundred, maybe two hundred tracks in a project. And if you've got that many, you need to have a way of locating tracks quickly. And having a colour scheme is one way of doing that. Um, so, I mean, there's several ways you can do this in Reaper. Right click on a track, uh, we get a track colour, uh, and you just pick a colour out of there. Um, a relatively new thing in Reaper, if you go to Options and Themes, uh, Theme Adjuster, Colour Controls, and then you can use these. So if I picked that one there, I could just pick a, a different colour for it. Um, and you, and Reaper actually defines these themes for you, which is a feature I've started making uh, more and more use of recently. Second preparatory stage, um, I call it stage 0A or something, um, go through each track in turn and make sure they're all good enough. So make sure there are no uh, clicks and pops or audio dropouts, uh, make sure uh, you know, if you're recording a guitar and you've got some amp hum before the guitar starts, make sure you cut that off. Um, so go through and make sure each track is as good as it can be. Um, this, again, will make your life much easier when you come to actually do the mixing proper. You hear people say the phrase, fix it in the mix sometime. There's no such thing, really. You can sort of make compromises and improve things, but, you know, it's much better to fix it on the way in. So. If, if ultimately, if you find that you have a track that's unusable, you know, re-record it. Okay, so, so we're all prepared, we've got organised, all our tracks are as good as they can be. Let's switch to the mixing uh, panel, which is what we're going to be mostly using here. So uh, on the PC, the shortcut for that is uh, Control M. And here we are, this is where we're going to be spending most of our time um, in the mixing process. Just one thing I will say about the layout of the mixer here. As I said before, we've not got that many tracks in this project, but if you did have loads and loads of tracks, there are some layout options uh, you can use here. So um, I've got that auto arrange tracks in mixer set here. So that will auto arrange them, but you can take that off and uh, just move tracks around um, self if you want. So you see, I've moved that uh, pad synth track over there. Um, you can also set uh, show multiple rows of tracks when size permits. This is important if you have a project with lots of tracks. So with that set on, if I just um, make that window smaller, you can see that it's arranged them into multiple rows. Uh, if I take that setting off and I do the same again, it doesn't do that. So they disappear and you have a scroll bar to scroll through them. So if I had the, a, a project with many more tracks than this, what I would do is I would have that setting on 
and you know I'd make this window as big as it can be on the screen uh, and I'd have multiple rows of tracks so I can see as many uh, as possible at the same time. Okay, stage one is game staging. What is game staging? Well, game staging is when you have all the faders in their default positions. So um, that would be there. You know, you can see where the default position is by this line, these little lines here on the tracks where our mouse point is going. With all the faders in a straight line there, we want all the tracks to be the same volume or roughly the same volume. Why do we do that? Well, supposing uh, you've gone through your uh, song and you've got the levels uh, pretty much where you want them, but you've had to turn one track right the way up to the top to get it at the correct volume. And then you start mixing and you realize, oh, actually, I need that track to be a little bit louder. Where do you go? It's already at the top of the fader. So there's nothing you can do. So what we're trying to do with gain staging is make sure that there's a similar volume in that straight line with all the faders there. So we have enough room on the fader to make the track louder or quieter as we see fit. It's essentially just making your life easier for the next step. So that's gain staging. Uh, there are a couple of ways I do gain stage. <laughs> <laughs> teeth in gain staging in Reaper. If you have a plugin on the track, so let's uh, let's pick this guitar as an example here. So I have Bias FX on this track, uh, making the guitar sound. We open that up. I can control how loud that track is using this master output here. So if it was too loud, I could turn it down. If it was too quiet, I can turn it up like that. If you don't have a plugin on the track, we can add a plugin to control the volume. So if I add a uh, plugin there and let's just search for whoops, vol, uh, volume adjustment. There we go. So you can see here uh, currently um, that plugin will increase the volume by 6 dBs. Take it down. I can make it go up. So um, just by using this volume adjustment plugin and that's all it does is alter the volume of the track. Um, we can uh, increase or decrease the volume with the faders all in that default position. So when you finish this, if we just go through, what you will see is with all the faders in this position, you'll play the song, the volume of all the tracks will be roughly the same. I'm just going to uh, tell you about stage two, which is optional, which is loading in a reference track. Uh, what's a reference track? You may have a particular sound that you're going for. There may be a song that you like that you want the song to sound you know, sonically similar to. And if you load it into Reaper, um, then as you're mixing, you can compare what your mixing moves are doing in comparison to that track. Now, I haven't used a reference track here. Um, one, you know, I don't want to play a commercial track video because of copyright restrictions. And two, uh, I didn't really feel the need to in the track. Um, so that's a stage that's up to you. Stage three is uh, an initial static mix basic levels. So what we're going to do here is we're going to listen through to the song from beginning to end, maybe two times. Um, and we're just going to move the faders just up and up or down to get the volumes relatively correct to each other. And we're not going to do anything complex and we're trying to do this stage quickly. The idea is to get quickly get a basic mix that sounds pretty good, where all the instruments are, are sound OK, sound pretty good for 80 to 90 percent of uh, the song. Um, it's important to, to not dwell on this. And I would say don't take more than 15 minutes to do this stage. Um, so we just play through the song. And we're just going to move faders as we see fit of course this, this song is mixed so I've already gone through all these stages but you get the idea that's all we're going to do it's a very basic very basic mix where we're just moving the faders to where everything sounds pretty good for most of the song and that gives us an initial mix that we can build on. At this stage, I'm going to make a very important point about taking regular breaks throughout this whole process. Um, it's 
especially if you're mixing on headphones like I do. Um, you may think I'm crazy to uh, mix on headphones, but it, it's the best option in this room for me, given the equipment that I have available to me. Um, so I would say, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot of time. Take a break. It doesn't have to be a long break, just five minutes, walk away, go and have a chat with someone, watch a bit of television, whatever. Um, because your ears do fatigue quite quickly, especially with headphones on. And if you don't do that, you will start making mixing moves without being able to judge them properly. And you'll come back the next day and listen to it and go, what was I thinking? Um, so take regular breaks. Stage four, check headroom. What do I mean by that? So play through the loudest part of your song. The loudest part of my song here, um, right here, right at the end, the last chorus. And what you're looking for is these numbers here, how loud the whole song is on the master track. Now, if that master track, if it peaks at, say, above minus six dBs, create a submix uh, bus, submix track. Um, so how I would do that is I could create a track here. Uh, I could just call it you know, submix. And what I can do is I'll then root, take the master send off all the tracks and I'll route all the tracks instead of to the master fader, I'll route them all to this um, submix here. And I guess the easiest way to do that is to use the routing matrix. So if, uh, yeah, here we go. So you can see all my tracks are routed to the uh, master um, fader there. I'm going to take all those off. Instead, I'm going to route everything to that submix that I just created. And the submix track itself is now the only one routed to the master fader. Now, so you can still hear everything. But what I can now do is control the level of the whole track using this submix fader. And so if this was peaking at above six, I could use this one to bring it down so it doesn't. And the reason we're doing that is simply for headroom to give us enough room so when we start messing around with the levels of individual tracks and we start making things louder that we're never in any danger of peaking out on the master fader and getting distortion and ruining the track. Okay then stage five is EQ. Uh, now very brief explanation of EQ. EQ is like a volume control for individual frequencies. So um, when you've got instruments that have a very similar frequency response, um, you can clear up fighting frequencies. You know, you could take out a bit of two kilohertz in, in one track and boost a bit of three kilohertz in another track. Very important to, to be able to have that very fine grained control to make sure all your instruments sit uh, nicely with each other in the mix. Now, I can't tell you what uh, EQ moves to make in your music. That depends entirely on your music. And always be guided by your ears, you know. Um, there are several standard EQ moves that you can make, but, you know, if, if it's a standard move that everyone, that, that you found a tutorial online that says, oh, you should do this, if it sounds rubbish in your song, then don't do it, you know. Do something else instead. Always be guided by what it sounds like. Now, Reaper's uh, EQ, the built-in EQ, re-EQ, um, is actually very, very good. So if we look here on this Trem guitar left, I have um, this rear EQ plugin. Um, and it's a fairly standard uh, EQ plugin. And as I said, it's a pretty good one. Um, so you've got four um, points that you can control here. Um, and you can see the moves that I've made. So now this illustrates one of the, those standard EQ moves that I was talking about. So very often with melodic instruments, it's common to use what is called a high pass filter. And that does what it says. It passes through high frequencies and it blocks all the rest. So if you've got um, a track like this where most of the low end is coming from the bass guitar and the bass drum, 
I don't want low end from other instruments interfering with that, like guitars. So I um, round about that hundred hertz mark there. I pass everything, all the frequencies above it, and cut all the frequencies below it. And that's what that does. If I if I turn that off, you could see that frequency response there is just a straight line. Enable that, and um, yeah, cuts off all the low end in that instrument. So it doesn't fight with the bass. Again, I've I've uh, this is a uh, sort of standardish move for, for guitars. I've cut a little bit at 1k there, boosted a little bit uh, at 2k, and boosted a little bit at 10k there. Now. I'm not going to go through a load of standard EQ moves because there are a million tutorials on uh, online on YouTube um, that will give you that information. But again, it's very important. Be guided by your ears and your own song and your own idea of what you want to sound like. One last point to make about EQ. In general, uh, favour cutting over boosting. So um, if you've got an option between cutting a frequency on one track and boosting it on another, I would favor cutting it on that one track. And if you're going to cut a frequency, so lower it, then, then make that cut a narrow cut. And if you're going to boost, make that a bit wider. So um, what that means is if I just exaggerate here, so if I pull that right, right down, uh, I can control how the shape of this curve here by using this bandwidth control. So when I say cut narrow, I mean, let's make that narrow there. Um, and then if I change this to be a boost, I say boost wide. So you can see that's a narrow boost. That's a wider boost. Uh, that's another general rule. Again, it's only a guideline. Uh, so it may not always be applicable, but cut narrow, boost wide. OK, then into stage six, which is compression. Very brief explanation of compression. If you've got uh, a track that's got a wide range of volumes, so it goes very quiet and very loud, what compression does is make the quieter parts louder and the louder parts quieter. So instead of having that big range of volumes, you get a shorter range of volumes. And what that's going to do is make it easier for that track to sit in your mix consistently. Um, rather than you always having to fight with the volume on that track and pulling the volume up when it's very low and pulling the volume down where it's very high. So I've got some compression on the piano tracks here. Reaper's compression plugin built in is very good. It's called Rear Comp. Let's just open that there. And let's just play um, the track. Now what you can see happening there is, see this little red bar coming down? So every time you see that coming down, it's reducing the volume of, of one of the higher volume bits. That's it really. Now, I'm not going to go through a, a detailed tutorial on compression. Again, there's loads of those online and on YouTube. You can give yourself a bit of a head start by using one of the presets as a starting point be, um, before you mess around with the parameters. Um, I've actually used an acoustic guitar preset on the piano here. Um, and what you'll end up doing is playing your track and just controlling the threshold here. So if I pull this right down, the piano will go a lot quieter. And you can see it's really, really clamping down on, the, on those louder volumes. Now, if I push it back up, the piano will go louder. So that's how you will basically use compression, is control that threshold uh, parameter so you get to a level where your, your track is sitting nicely in the mix. The other thing you can do is use, let's just start that again, it's called Makeup Gain. So if I use this control, you can hear it going louder. What we're effectively doing there is the volume at the top has come down and then we're lifting the whole volume of the track back up again. Um, and it, that, that's what I mean by squashing the signal. Okay, we're nearly there now. Stage seven is automation. Now, as you're going through uh, your track and you're, you're, mix, you're moving the faders up and down to get everything at the right volume, you may find that there's one track 
that you have to do that a lot on. You have to, okay, this bit needs to be louder, but this bit needs to be quieter. Oh, this bit needs to be louder again. This needs to be very quiet. Um, and you, you find yourself throughout the entire mix uh, constantly moving the faders up and down. And if you've got that on more than one track, um, well, you're scuppered really, because how do you <laughs> move quickly between tracks? Um, what you can do is use automation to record those moves you've made on the fader and play them back so you don't have to move the fader manually. Now in this track I didn't use any automation because I didn't need to, it just didn't need it. So let's uh, let's form a quick uh, example there. Let's take the drums track. We click on this trim button. Um, you can see all the parameters we can control with automation. Volume is one of the most common ones. Um, if we, uh, where it says automation mode, select right here um, what this will do is any moves I make on the fader it will record them so let's just play the song and I'll move the fader as it's playing so you can hear I took the drums right down there and brought them right back up again and you can see that that's made this curve here uh, that volume automation curve if we then um, select uh, this again and now change that back to trim stroke read what that will do is it will read back those volume moves that I made on the fader so have a listen I'm not doing anything to the fader at all now here are my hands And you can hear the, the move that I did make on the fader is now being played back without me actually having to move the fader manually. Okay, so we're at the last stage now. We, we've done our EQ and compression, uh, any automation necessary, or after we've done our first initial basic static mix, we're now on to uh, mixing down to a stereo track. So in Reaper, that's very, very simple. If we go to File, Render, and there's a few different settings uh, set. You can choose how much of this track you want to render. So you could have the, the time selection. So um, we you know, just if I selected that much, it would uh, only render that much of the track. Or back to that uh, render dialog, um, we could select entire project, and, and there's a few other settings there. So I'm not going to go into. Um, you pick a folder for your track to go into and a file name um, and there's various settings uh, that you can play around with here. Uh, generally, I would have thought that the defaults would be okay. It's a long time since I first installed Reaper so I can't remember what the defaults are. But um, 44.1 kilohertz sample rate and stereo is, is really, um, good. That's uh, CD uh, quality. Um, WAV format, 24-bit PCM is what I always uh, render down to. And then we click the render one file button. Um, it's going to change the file name of that so I don't um, overwrite the one I've already done. Uh, render one file. And there we go. There it is rendering that file down to a stereo WAV file. Okay, so there you go. You have your, your final stereo WAV file mixed down. You're not quite finished what you want to do now is you want to take that file you want to listen to it on lots of different systems so uh, you know your computer through headphones hi-fi system uh, you know, stereo that might be in the kitchen your car stereo uh, listen to it on something you know with really crappy tinny no bass response speakers like a phone um, Listen to it on as many different systems as possible and make sure it sounds good on all of those. Um, if anything needs changing, take notes and you can go back to the mixing process uh, and make, um, make little adjustments there. Um, and, and listen out for things like, you know, anything fighting for space in the mix, um, anything that overpowers everything else. And it's good to do that on systems that you're familiar with so you know what you know what sounds good through the system but you know don't have unrealistic expectations don't expect a huge amount of bass coming out of the phone because it's 
physically impossible with a tiny little speaker. Okay, so that's it. We have our uh, hopefully final mixed down stereo WAV track. Now, the next stage in the process will be mastering. Um, we'll take that file that's come out of the mix process and put that through a mastering process, which is actually a lot simpler and should be quicker process than mixing. Um, now look out for an upcoming tutorial on me taking you through that exact process, taking this track, my mix down track here, and putting it through the mastering process. And hopefully at the end of that, we have a track that's ready for release. Okay then, thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe and hit that bell, like and share this video. Don't forget to check out the links in the description below. Keep making music and I'll see you again in the next video. Cheers.